Today we have a session with Annette Bruton. This is our 100th virtual bridge session and I for one am very excited to be engaged in this conversation with Annette. I worked at Edinburgh College a number of years ago and Annette was principal at the time and Annette has since been kind enough to come and uh, facilitate some of the workshops on our preparing for executive leadership program and to be Frank, she just blew my mind in when she shared her experience um, she just blew my mind with her honesty and how she perceived the sector and the work that went on. So really looking forward to this session. Annette is, uh, as I mentioned, Annette Bruton is the retired principal of Edinburgh College. She is also now a fellow with CDN and she's on the board of SRUC. So you're very welcome, Annette. I have some questions that I've uh, put together because I'm really curious about your perspective of the FE sector. And I know that you were a leader in mainly in the public sector where you had a number of different leadership roles in the public sector. And then in 2015, you took on the role of principal at Edinburgh College. And I'm really curious as to what drew you to leadership within the FE sector. Well, thanks very much, Valerie. And can I say, first of all, I'm really pleased to be here. I was trying to think of knowing you well, I was trying to think of what your motivation was for asking me to do the 100th session. And I wondered if maybe it was the person nearest to age 100 that you actually knew who was still prepared to come online and speak. So, um, however, I guess that would be David Attenborough. So anyway, I'm really delighted to be here and very happy to talk openly and uh, both formally and informally about my experience in the FE sector. Um, yes, you're right. I had a lot of jobs in the public sector before I came to Edinburgh College and my mother, bless her, when I would tell her that I'd got this new job, being very pleased with myself that I got another promotion, would bring me down to earth by saying, well, can you not just hold on to the job you've got? And um, so that, that was interesting because that was a different perspective on how often you should uh, move around. But I worked uh, for 20 years, really, in frontline classroom teaching in high schools. Um, I've been an inspector of education. Uh, I've been a chief inspector of education. I ran the education authority at um, Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen Education, Culture and Sport Department. Um, and just before I joined Edinburgh College, I was the chief executive at the Care Inspectorate. So all of my experience was really around education. And, um, and part of that, when I was in the Inspector of Education, was about developing a child protection system in Edinburgh. So hence the care background. So what drew me to um, Edinburgh College? Well, um, I started my teaching career in and around, well, started in Dundee, but very quickly uh, worked in and around the Lothian area where I was born and grew up. I'm an East Lothian uh, lass. And when the job at Edinburgh College came up, not only was I excited about the prospect of a move to a part of the education sector I'd never been in. I'd had a really good experience of working with FE colleges when I was in Aberdeen City Council. Um, but also change was afoot in, um, in the college sector. Some good, some not so good actually, some of legacies we're still dealing with at this moment, which have been quite difficult. But it seemed to me as I came to probably the last formal chapter of my teaching life, I was really excited to take on a new challenge. Edinburgh College, like many other colleges in Scotland, was dealing with some of the difficulties of merger. And I'd done a couple of mergers in my previous career, and I'd learned quite a lot about how mergers can be handled. Um, but also, um, I reckon that the students at Edinburgh College, the 17, 18,000 of them that there were when I joined, probably between myself and my husband, we probably taught most of their mothers and grandmothers uh, over the years. So it seemed to me like a kind of full circle coming back to work in a part of the education sector I'd not worked in before, but also because I developed a tremendous respect for the life-changing ability of further education and higher education colleges. And I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but actually I think that's at the heart of everybody who's really passionate about 
college education because we tangibly see on a day-to-day -day basis the difference that makes for young people's lives. So that was really what motivated me to come to what was essentially a new sector for me. But learning's learning's learning and you need a different pedagogical approach to not only people at different ages in their uh, education career, but also in different stages in their context. So even within um, college education, we need a different pedagogical approach for people coming straight from school and those who are returning from having had professional careers. So that seemed to me to be like a really exciting challenge. So that was really what motivated me to come uh, to work at Edinburgh College. And Annette, you, you touched on something there when you said there were challenges, there were challenges around merger. Um, and I worked in the college at the time. And I can remember speaking to colleagues saying, who would want that? Just who would want to take on that job? Because that was, and I can see a couple of my colleagues in the, um, from Edinburgh College here, I can see that they're agreeing. Um, so at that point in your career, knowing that it was going to be a real challenge, what, what is it that made you take that on? Well, a couple of things. One, I'd done, I'd been through mergers before. And mm. what I learned is that if you go in, to an organization and understand and believe that 90% of the people who work there want to do the very best they can for the students at least 90% of the time, that actually there are no insurmountable problems. There are wicked issues, there are things that get people upset, there are things that don't go well, there's risks to students' education in all of that. And not everything about the way that mergers were handled in Scotland were done effectively. I don't think there was enough pre-planning. I don't think there was enough thought through of what the wicked issues would be. But actually, I've yet to meet an organisation where most of the staff come in to try to do a bad job. It doesn't exist, I don't think, in the public sector. So it seemed to me that if you start from the premise, that there's a lot of really good people who feel that really bad stuff's been done, then actually that's your starting point. And the other thing is, if you listen to what people are saying, you might not always agree with them, and that might not be the way you go, but you'll learn a huge amount about how not to repeat mistakes. And I suppose I also knew from previous experience that if you try to start something new and bring people together and you don't pay attention to the legacy, it's like creating grief for people. It's like saying everything you were before no longer matters everything you did before was wrong. So in the first year in the job at Edinburgh College, I had a lot to do to get the finances back in order, but also I had a lot to do to try and unpick the, if you like, the binning of legacy that people fundamentally believed was not just part of their culture, but part of their own commitment to their, their teaching. And the the biggest challenge for me was to get to the root of what the problem was. So the stated problem was that the college was millions of pounds in the red, and that's factually correct, but that wasn't the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem was that we didn't recruit enough or the right kinds of students to solve the financial problem. So for me, taking on a job like that, which people call a poison chalice, mm -hmm. actually is all about understanding what's really going on and how to unlock the potential that of the staff who work there who feel they've been stifled. Now, that's a bumpy road because not everybody agrees on what the problems are. Not everybody agrees that my, that my take on it is the right take. But when I began to see people coming forward with their own ideas in the college and coming forward in spades with brilliant ideas, I knew actually that we were beginning to, to shift forward and the grief was beginning to diminish a little bit. Oh, thank you. I've also heard you speak about people who don't agree with you and people who do agree with you and how important it is to listen to everybody yeah. really. Can I get you to just say a little bit around yeah, that? Yeah. Well, one of the things I learned in my career actually is that I'm quite a, I'm quite a poor listener. It's not that I don't listen to people, I don't hear what they have to say, it's I don't give them time to think. So I went on a course once um, that the civil service um, sent me on um, to work with leaders from across the UK. One of the things I discovered on that course actually is that I jumped to 
I'm quite a quick decision maker. And what I tended, what I've tended to do in the past is exclude people who come two days later to say, I've been thinking about what you said and I don't think you're right. Mm -hmm. um, just because I'm always in a rush to get somewhere. But actually, if you can really begin to hear the perspective of people who don't agree with you, that is twice as valuable as just listening to the echo chamber that you've created for yourself around the people who agree with you. It's far more comfortable to spend time with people who agree with you and not everybody who disagrees with you is right. Sometimes they are very wrong. And so I kind of have groups of people. I have the honorable opposition and what I call the dishonorable opposition and they have different motivations. But listening to what people have to say and not having a nervous breakdown when people come back after three days and say, I've thought about what you said and I know I agreed at the time, but I think there's another way to go. It's really valuable to listen to that. And it's really hard because we're all under huge pressure to get decisions made and move forward. But for me, and actually I still have to force myself to do that. That doesn't come naturally to me. I like to hear people agree with me. Um, but then you have to really reflect on what are the people who are not agreeing with you really saying. Okay, I think that's a real golden nugget. So thank you for that one, Annette. Now, the thing is, 18 months ago, you retired, um, but haven't quite left the sector. As we said earlier, you're a fellow with CDN and you've been very supportive of me and the team. Uh, and you're also on the board of SRUC. But I'm curious, having been in the depths of it, now sort of being on the outside, what do you see when you're looking in from a different yeah. perspective? Well, it's Val, it's been a really interesting two years. It's just over two years since I left Edinburgh College now. And I had a lot of phone calls from people asking me if I'd like to take on another job and trying to get me to apply for principal's jobs elsewhere. If I wanted to continue to be a principal, I would have stayed at Edinburgh College because I loved it there. So there was quite a lot of pressure, which is a kind of combination of pressure and it, it makes you quite kind of, I don't know, you get a buzz out of people asking you to do jobs. Um, but I was able to resist most of that because there were other things I wanted to do. But one of the things that I didn't resist was the invitation within really six months of being um, retired to go and help out at New College Lanarkshire and the transition between uh, the principal who was leaving to go and go, go and do another job and a new principal coming in. And actually New College Lanarkshire were experiencing some of the very same stormy waves that Edinburgh College had been through for exactly the same reasons to do with the way that mergers were set up. So I actually worked there part time and then full time over a kind of seven month period. So although I had left the sector, I kind of hadn't. So I was doing this consultancy and then acting principal role. So it was really last year at this time that I got retired really from the sector. Um, but the time at New College Lancashire was a really useful time for me to reflect on all the changes that were happening in the sector at that time. But I wasn't really the long term Principal. So while I was doing some strategic development with the team, actually that was somebody else's job. But it also gave me a chance to reflect on what was going on in the sector. And there was a lot of turbulence in the sector. We've been through a very turbulent period in terms of change. We've been through a turbulent period in terms of uh, staff uh, relationships and, um, and, and the contractual changes and the financial changes in the sector. So it was very interesting to look at that. But also as a fellow at CDN, I get the chance to listen to what potential future strategic leaders are, um, are saying and thinking the questions they're asking. And I also sit on the board at SRUC and actually I've just stepped out of that meeting just now um, and we'll go back in when we're finished here. And so I've had the opportunity this year to see firsthand some of the fantastic work that the leaders at all levels in SRUC, and I can, I can only assume across the entirety of the sector and every member of South, the way people have pulled together this year has been quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. There's a way for the honour system to honour every single person who worked in, in the college sector in this country. I would vote for that because people have just done amazing, amazing work. And I might say a bit about that in a minute when we talk about the future. But as opposed to stepping outside the sector, one of the things I've been reflecting on this year is how do we get that leadership 
How do we develop leadership skills in people in organisations which are quite hierarchical and quite structural and where we're just really beginning now to break down some of these hierarchical ban uh, uh, barriers and allow people at all levels in organisations to actually take the lead on things? So one of the things about the public sector that I love is the opportunity for people to develop a career inside the public sector. But one of the things that the public sector um, is hindered by is the very hierarchical structures that we tend to have in the public sector. And so for me, looking from the outside in and being one of a slew of principals who retired at the same time, what I'm looking at is, um, and it's something CDN is trying to address, is a lack of real, not just leadership training, but leadership experience. And I'm not talking about management experience, but real leadership experience. So that people from the minute they come into their careers in the college sector can develop those leadership skills so that we've got a, so that we've got a much more vibrant pool of people who are coming to the senior roles in, in colleges. And people who come with a more innovative and um, fresh, mindset with each generation coming forward. So that's been my big reflection on the sector this year. And in a sense, the sector didn't really get to settle down after all the strike action and the disruption that we had the year before. It's not really had the chance to settle down because of the pandemic. But I think when it does, for me, what I would like to see is all the work that got started on pedagogy, learning and teaching, putting students at the centre, becoming more fleet of foot adaptable and a much, much more dispersed form of leadership. Those are the things I think the college sector was on the verge of really doing some super work on. And actually it's been kind of not put on hold, but it's been knocked back a bit. So I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to revisit a lot of that because people have been having to be dealing with really pragmatic matters this year. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. But one of the things I've observed as well is that this year has given college leaders the opportunity to make changes that may have taken significantly longer to make in terms of working with staff and working with students. And I've seen college leaders um, just really step up and step in and, and make things happen. You know, for me, nothing has really slipped through the net they've been working really hard but there has been they have been much more agile and responsive and in a way a lot of of the leaders that i'm working with now on, on some of the courses that we're doing people are saying actually this has given us an opportunity to kind of shift and to move and to be able to 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 step into that leadership role and to be able to encourage all staff to step into to leadership roles I, th I think that's right. I think in the middle of a crisis, though, which essentially is what this is, what we don't know yet is which of those things will have benefited students and which of those mm -hmm. things will have simply got us through this difficult period. And that, that I think, is, I, you know, I absolutely have seen firsthand mm -hmm. at SRUC some of the innovation that's taken place. What we don't know yet is what the impact of all of that is going to be on students. And I suspect as probably all of you do, that the impact of that will be different on different groups of students, depending mm -hmm. on their context and background. And we don't know in the long term what the impact of all of that is going to be on staff, whether people yeah. see that as a kind of in the bunker thing that has to be done. And then when life returns to something more like an even keel, whether in fact people's learned behaviours want to take them back again or whether we appraise it differently uh, going forward. But certainly there is no doubt that, you know, I, I remember thinking last April that I didn't know whether in fact education would just simply stop for a year. You know, would education just stop for a year? And it hasn't stopped for a year, but it's not without its downsides. It's not without its, you know, the negative side of that, particularly around the social interaction because what I suppose if we were moving and thinking about the future, for me, um, college, uh, whether that's the further education side of college or the higher education side of college, college isn't just about getting qualifications. That's a really important part of it, but it's also about learning. It's also about applied learning. And I think applied learning is the part that's hardest to maintain in a quality way 
when we're in this position where we can't be in workshops, we can't be in studios. So it will be really interesting. So from an academic point of view, I mean, I, I'm a, an online learner myself. I'm doing a degree in textiles and fine art and have been doing for a few years. So I was kind of used to that. But interestingly, the place where I'm a student, the Open College of the Arts, has actually started doing a much better job of what it was doing as online teaching because it's learning from other colleges and universities who've had to come in to their sector really and they're feeling quite challenged by that. So I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening. My caution is that we need to think about the social and the practical elements because for me, tertiary education is all about applied learning. Whether that's an entry level course for plumbing or whether it's a postgraduate degree. There is no point in education without having an application in the world. So, so that's the bit that I'm most interested in seeing how we handle going forward. Okay. And, and what do you envisage? Like if you if you had a crystal ball, um, or even if you kind of kind of sensed into what you how you might see the sector in five or ten years time, what 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 are your thoughts around that? Well, we we had a bit of a discussion in Edinburgh College three years ago when we were thinking about the blueprint for the future that was around the kind of phrase anytime, any place, anywhere. So could we create an environment where our students could elect to learn anytime, any place, anywhere? Could they be doing the learning on the bus from Humby to Edinburgh. For those of you who don't know, Humby's a teeny tiny village just on the, out, the furthest outer markers of, um, uh, of Edinburgh College's um, area. Uh, could people come to college on a Saturday or Sunday morning because they've got a full-time job and they're single parents, but they want to learn to step up the, to the next stage of the, the care job that they're working in? Um, could we find a way where we could use not just electronic means, but other means to think about how we could make learning more bespoke and get more learning out to people who couldn't always attend in person in a college. So one of the things this year's done has actually been a gigantic exper experiment in how we could actually take the distance learning part of that forward. So for me, I think there are real advantages in having that as a tool in our toolbox as educators. However, I get a bit chilled when I hear people saying eh, things, things won't go back to the way they were. So I'm not worried about that per se, but when I hear people saying, oh, we're going to keep most of it online now and we're going to keep most of it, because actually I know as a highly motivated, quite elderly student how hard it is to sustain open or even blended learning over a long period of time. And I do worry about the fabric of society if we don't create the opportunity that colleges were creating before, which is to allow people to grow up together. So I think the future for me will be about taking all the learning that we've done this year and actually taking all the things that we've not been able to do this year and look at them through a completely different lens. So that we have colleges that are more versatile, where we have more short courses that can add up to a longer course, where we have more opportunities for people to, and I know in theory we do this, but the, the steps between one level in college and another, or between one subject in college and another can be very, very high indeed. So can we smooth out that gradient? All the things that we've been talking about for years, we now have some tools to help us to do that. So okay. for me, the future is building on some of the exciting things we've had done this year. We also need to think about the pace for staff, for colleagues, because actually what we've done this year is unsustainable over time. So, you know, it's a testament stuff that they've done so much, but actually we need to not go back to everything we did before, but we need to start again with a new lens and say, how can we take all this new learning that we've got and actually make sure that before we chuck all that old bath water out, there's no babies lurking around in the bath. So I think there's a really vibrant future the backdrop of the review of tertiary education that's going on at the moment, I think we'll see a very difficult landscape. I think there will be a political appetite to take the college review onto the next stage quite soon, maybe not next year, but you know, the year after. So I think it's a continually changing landscape. And so for me, 
I would see that the reach of colleges should be far greater than it is at the moment. I think too many people think that colleges are simply about FE and actually my heart is an FE. I was a learning support teacher to trade for a long time. I think it's a fabulous part of what we do, but that whole lifetime learning that we talk about, what I would like, what I, what I hope we'll see in the next 10 years is that really crystallizing and that people are never out of colleges in the whole of their lifetime from the age of 16 to the age of 100. So that would be what I would think we would all be hoping to strive for. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, and quite inspiring as well. Now, we have a few minutes um, and there's been a couple of, of um, questions coming in, in the in the comment in the chat section. But I'd like to actually open it up and see if anybody wants to um, ask Annette directly, if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask. Can I can I just um, answer Jamie's question about <laughs> schools? So I come from a schools background. I was, you know, most of my working life was spent in schools, and I know that schools have started developing salons and woodwork and so on. Actually, when I started teaching, they already had those in the first place. So I, I you know, I know why schools do that. They do it because it's actually easier than transporting students into the college. My personal view is it is nothing like a college experience. So there's nothing wrong with a good school experience. I've invested most of my life in it. Um, but actually for, the, for more, um, ex, for more um, a, where you need a sort of expertise, not just to, look, to offer introduction to hairdressing, which schools could do, I think any course that's an introduction to hairdressing has to be delivered or introduction to woodwork or, you know, introduction to welding has to be done in the context of where can that go next? So I think all teachers in high schools have a good understanding of if you, I was a geography teacher, if you study geography, they know where that's going. They've done their geography degree. They've been, you know, some of them have actually even had jobs that have been to do with the environment. So they understand that context. What I'm really worried about is that we somehow see that the, 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 the applied courses, that what we call vocational courses, applied learning courses at the entry level can be taught by just about anybody. And I disagree with that. I think there's an expertise lies in colleges that understands where if you've done that course, where it goes next and where it goes next and where it goes next. And, and really understands the industry's context. So there's a lot of school college partnerships, stuff that's going on that, really, that I'm really proud of, stuff that I've initiated myself, but I'm a little bit worried about thinking that rather than think about solutions to bringing students together to do some of these applied learning courses that we stick a salon in a school and it's not really part of a coherent progressive journey but maybe someday maybe Jamie you would disagree with me on that. No that makes a lot of sense um, I worked at Borders College for a year um, amongst other places and uh, there was definitely a kind of sense of community around the college and Kenji and I have discussed this before about comparing it to Canada and things like that and where people are invested in the, the college community and it's uh, it's seen as, um, as opening doors rather than just a kind of place you turn up um, is it often in the bigger cities or, or a, a, a something that needs to be to be done a kind of study that needs to be undertaken so um, yeah it's just it's, it's where that balance lies obviously and um, these PFI partnerships um, for the new schools are, are some are, are, are woefully inadequate and some are a bit over the top. Of there's a school near where I live and it's got the they built a, they've converted a porta cabin outside into a restaurant, very much like the training and dining rooms that you've got in um, obviously in, in colleges. And I just saw that was a bit of obviously replication. Um, but I know that a lot of the courses, <coughs> excuse me, are delivered by college lecturers in, in the schools anyway. So as long as there's that kind of bridge, but it's just, it's interesting that obviously if they, they, they see, they associate that too much to school, my fear was that they would not, you know, they think that's something you do at school, you don't progress on any further, they more encouragement to leave school rather than to progress on. Yeah, I'm certainly very conflicted around all of that. And, you know, I, I've quite often been involved in that debate about, you know, 
students at the age of 15 or 16 can't get up in the morning and get on a bus to go to college or whatever well you know the real world's just around the corner and that's what they're going to have to do so so I mean I'm not discouraging links between schools and colleges I mean one of our fantastic staff at Edinburgh College volunteered in her own time to go and teach a higher um a home economics class uh, um well, really, essentially, food preparation class. Halfway through the year, when the member of staff left, uh, teachers in that subject area are very thin on the ground in schools and they couldn't get a replacement teacher. And she offered to go and teach the class in the school for the whole of the rest of the session. And not only did the students do really well, they said they had an experience that was very different from anything they'd ever had before. So there's maybe some kind of merging of people that actually goes beyond, you know, I wouldn't like to be a, a, a head teacher who thinks that they can set up a hospitality school inside the school and then have their baking oven break down and need to spend £50,000 to repair it. So there are practical reasons as well, where if, you know, if you're doing what I would call, you know, entry level or kitchen sink science there's all sorts of things you can do in any kind of environment but one of the things that if that further and higher education colleges do that second to none or should do is providing we get the funding from the government is keep up to date with industry standard and that would be extremely difficult for schools to do so i think it lies in the partnership and the exchange of people rather than really completely reinventing an infrastructure at local level. I do, however, though, thinking about any time, any place, anywhere, that there are elements of absolutely every single course that we can make more flexible and that students can study um, in, their, in their home, on the bus, you know, at a community centre. So colleges need to not be closing the door on the notion that we need to be more flexible and do more outreach and certainly not get into a bun fight or a territory fight with schools. Okay. Thank you, Annette. Um, I'd like to see if there's, we probably have time for one more question. So if anybody has a question, Kenji. Kenji is in like a greyhound out of a trap. On you go, Kenji. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I'd just like to say something about, you, you talk about industry. And I remember in the late eighties, industry was a key component of the educational experience. There was something that some people in the room might remember called sandwich courses. That, that was the thing. And statistically, uh, in the university sector, one third of all courses that were offered, offered a sandwich element. And in the space of three years, that drifted away to almost zero. And now we're in a time of apprenticeships and, and the key links of industry. How do you feel colleges could do more to keep up with the needs of industry bearing in mind that we have generally assessment routines with awarding bodies that don't necessarily are not necessarily as flexible to keep up with the trends in the industry how do we keep our staff current with everything that's going on in industry how can we make sure we're keeping pace yeah that's a really excellent question and um a uh, for me, you know, graduate, graduate courses, graduate apprenticeships, eh, all the apprenticeships in colleges go some way, I suppose, in that direction. They're a bit narrow, narrowly focused, in my view, and it's not the same as actually being um, in employment. But the point about staff is you, you've touched on something there that I think is one of the aspects of college life that was one of the most variable aspects that I observed. So in Edinburgh College, for example, I could point to several departments, several individuals within departments whose work in relation to keeping their own industry skills up and actually influencing and helping industry to move forward were second to none, were outstanding things that absolutely blew me away and other places where staff not only resisted the notion of working directly with industry but saw as some kind of challenge to what was already an established knowledge and skill set that they had so the point the question you're asking the point you're making Kenji actually I think could unlock the key to the future of how colleges work so I would like to see colleges at the forefront of doing 
um, research and development for industry. I would like to see people able to exchange jobs in industry and not just because you happen to know somebody who works in the local graphics company and you're a graphic designer and you can go for a year and you can swap jobs, but really much, much more wholesale than that. In Canada, um, senior staff, and in fact, uh, other staff who apply for it can get a sabbatical every three to five years. They go for a year and, and go and do some research or they come and actually work in industry. I would like to see some kind of scheme where people could go for six months or go for a year and work in their own industry, not just to get their skills up, but to understand the blue sky thinking that's going on and where the future is going, because it's not good enough for us to keep up with industry. I think we need to be influencing that. So one of the things that in Edinburgh, the um, city deal partnership led to was identifying areas of practical um, industry-based research that the college could be doing with its students that would help to take forward solutions for small business providers, because in the Lothian area, most of the businesses are small and medium-sized enterprises. So there's opportunities for us not just to keep our own skills up, but that requires investment. And I think that's investment well worth making because we want our students to be both students and employees. Why would we not want to create an academy system in our colleges where every member of staff is both a student and and, and a teacher? So I think there's huge, huge potential and I think every single college could look inside its own walls and find people who are already doing that in an excellent way and use that as a standard for moving forward. Annette, thank you so much for that. Um, sometimes I can feel my heart sink and, and just listening to you say that has made my heart sink. I'm aware that you've taken time out of a, of a board meeting to come and share your knowledge and your wisdom and those little golden nuggets with us uh, so, and I'm very very grateful for that I know that you've got to go straight back into that meeting now that's right isn't it so what I'd like to do again is to thank you for coming along and um, sharing all that wisdom and, and your perspective because it's really really valuable I, I personally found that very inspiring that set me up for the rest of the day um, and I look forward to working with you again, Annette. I keep saying that. I keep <laughs> the links going. <laughs> well, thanks, Ali. And thanks, everybody who came for coming. And thanks to all the future people who are going to be watching this for, for taking the time to watch. So hopefully I'll get a chance to work with all of you at some stage or do some training with you or whatever. So thanks. Thanks That's very lovely. much. Thanks okay. again, Annette. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.